Good morning, everyone. This is your friend, educator, and mentor, Sidhi Bangar. So let's start. We've been waiting for this prelims test series. So I hope you had a good friendship day and a good Raksha Bandhan. Uh, briefly about me, I'm Sidhi Bangar, and I have three years of teaching experience. I did my undergraduation from BID Mesra, appeared for four mains and an interview, and qualified for all the CATs at another MBA exams, and did my post graduation MBA and HR from XLRI Jamshedpur. With that, folks, we'll proceed for today. So, at an academy, you get daily live classes, live test and quizzes, structured courses. That means all our courses are aligned to the UPSC syllabus and unlimited access. With one uh, subscription under the UPSC CSE category, you get access to all our courses that are recorded uh, or live right now or, or upcoming. Uh, additionally, as you can see, the success of an academy, we had announced 35 toppers from um, an academy yesterday. 35 people actually made it to the coveted civil services merit list. The results were announced for UPSC civil services 2019 exam yesterday. So, uh, folks, we also have the plus uh, subscription about which you're already familiar and under which you get all these facilities. We also have iconic program especially for the freshers and for the repeat aspirants so that they get that one right way to actually go ahead in their journey for UPSC. Under this program, uh, you will have a personal mentor who will help you throughout the three stages of the exam, the prelims, the mains, the answer writing, optional selection, and finally the interview stage where he'll help you out with personality development or to fill out the detailed application form. So our subscription plans are as follows. For the plus, it is 44,000, but you get an instant 10% off if you use my code SBUS. And for the plus course, again, for two years, the cost comes down to 58,000. If you use my code SBUS, you get an instant 10% off. And similarly for the Iconic, so for a 24 month subscription to the Iconic program, you get an instant 10% off if you use my code SBUS and it comes for less than 45,000 per year. And for a yearly iconic uh, subscription program, the cost comes down to less than 58,000. So definitely the two year program is worth enrolling to and you get an instant 10% off if you use my code SBUS. You can use my code SBUS for any of the UPSC, CSE category courses or programs, whichever you choose. So iconic is plus, Something more and that something more is personal coach, daily means Q&A practice, study planner and personalized feedback. So a complete program under the single roof. So choose wisely, choose an academy and choose iconic. Folks, those who have been following me regularly, I also have a new course launch. Uh, I have already completed the India and the World Asia edition on YouTube. 21 videos under this are already there on the YouTube. The playlist is already uh, with all of you guys in my Telegram channel. I'm launching a new course on Unacademy between 10th to 23rd August 2020. The timings will be 8.30 p.m. in the evening, one hour session each, and we'll be covering India, Japan, India, Russia, India, USA, India, Middle East, and India, Africa in part one, because we've already covered India and its neighbors in the Asia edition. And then going on to the September course, which will be launched in September on Unacademy only, the India and the World Series, I will be covering Latin America, Europe and the international organization. So with these three parts, we will be completely covering IER. So who is this course for? This is for the political science and IER students because it has a full coverage of India and the world. You need not look any further. And for GS mains also because I will be covering all the current events related to international relations. So your IER part for the GS will also be covered in this course. Nothing will be left out. So a complete course all in all. With that, folks, this is again another of my course already running on an academy, a complete course for science and technology, current affairs between May 2019 to May 20. Please go and check it out. We'll start for today. So the ground rules remain the same. Feel free to do as many questions wrong as you can and to make as many mistakes as you can. Because once you make mistakes here, you won't repeat them there in the prelims examination that I'm quite sure of. Because if you have decided to do UPSC civil services, you're already intelligent enough to identify that you won't be making any more mistakes. Then don't be sad if you don't perform well today. It is okay. Everybody has a bad day. Even Usain Bolt has had a, has bad days. And so does Roger Federer and so does Michael Schumacher and so does Michael Phelps. So that's okay. Also, 
there will be 20 to 30 seconds given to read each question and 30 seconds to answer it except for the rapid fire round you already know the rules and most importantly it's a morning session we are meeting after friendship day and raksha bandhan so enjoy the session that's what it is for and i believe that you will improve each day so believe along with me that you will improve each day so with that folks good morning to everybody who's here yes and we'll start okay i'm all good suman thank you good morning prashant and nandu so we'll first start with the monthly five all right and there you go the first question is on your screen folks and after 15 seconds i'll start the timer uh danny not exactly 60 seconds all the time sometimes 50 sometimes 60 it'll be like that but you will get enough time to read the question and the time starts now. Okay, so I have received one answer as of now. No, I've received a couple of answers. Why is everybody saying WHO? For what reason are you saying WHO? Because when we, whenever we are talking about children, the most intuitive answer that can be is UNICEF. United Nations Children's Education Fund. Yes? So, the correct answer is actually option number B, UNICEF. It is not WHO and this report was recently released at the very fag end of July. So, I've covered it in the August month. Now, the toxic truth, children's exposure to lead pollution undermines a generation of potential. Why? Good morning, Sagar. Uh, Nandu has decided to skip it. Uh, the first correct answer was given by Shubh Srivastav, then Shivranjani, Gaurish, Danny, Pabali, Madhu, Kaveri. And Ganga have answered it correctly. Okay, folks. So, this report recently came out. And the highlight of the report was that the report is first of its kind when it comes to lead pollution in children. Now, why is it so important? Because the lead particles which get into your body actually harm your central nervous system. And it hinders the brain development in a child. However, the report says that one in three children up to 800 million globally have blood lead levels above 5 micrograms per deciliter which is very very high and which is something that requires action and in fact why is it important for India because nearly half of these children that means 400 million of these children actually live in South Asia and majority of them live in India. So it's very very important that we take care that this kind of lead pollution doesn't spread to children. Now let's take a deeper look at what exactly is happening. So what are the sources of lead exposure? So, it can be burning materials containing lead, for example, smelting, recycling, stripping, leaded paint. In fact, the paint that we have in our houses, it is advised that you actually keep getting your house repainted. It shouldn't chip because lead particles are released from that paint. So, lead is a constituent of the paint that we use in our houses and is one of the most prevalent and prominent sources of lead contamination. Also, leaded gasoline or leaded petrol. Can you see on petrol pumps that it is uh, leaded petrol? And then there is uh, lead-free petrol also, which is a little bit costlier. Or leaded aviation fuel. So, they are all causes of lead pollution. Now, children, especially these uh, very, very uh, young children are extremely vulnerable because their body is more prone to lead poisoning. They absorb lead more easily than the adults. So, that's why it's very, very important that we save our children from this. In fact, it happens mostly in India because we also use certain types of ancient cosmetics or medicines. For example, coal, the carbon black that we use also had has lead contamination. So, and more importantly, why is it harmful? Because if women, they have lead stored in their bones and teeth, then during the pregnancy, that lead releases into the body of the infant. So, it can actually spread from the mother to the child also. So, that's why it's very, very important that we control the lead pollution that happens in infant children. Good morning, Mansi. 
With that, folks, let's come to the second question. Uh, I'll give you 20 seconds to read it and 30 seconds to answer. Any doubts so far? <coughs> okay, your time starts now. It's an easy one. It's again, uh, since it's from the monthly reviews, it's something you must have read in the newspapers already. Okay, I've got a couple of answers here. So, yes, it's C. Most of you have got it correct. So, Aslam, Pobali, Nandu, Mansi, Shivranjani. Most of you have got it correct. Yes, it is. Both these actually are right. So, this, this is a latest push to start up India movement. We already have this movement and as a push to this, we now also have AIM iCrest. I will talk about it in great detail. So we are actually, we will be helping or we will be setting up incubators which will help the startup ecosystem. How? By training those startup entrepreneurs and providing them with either financial capital or human resource capital or aiding them in understanding the entrepreneurship landscape in a better manner. Now let's look at this. So... Neeti's IOGS, it was just launched in the fag end of uh, July and August. And here, it's actually a joint venture between Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Vadhwani Foundation. Let's look at what Atal Innovation Mission has apart from this. So, Atal Innovation Mission is actually government's flagship initiative for innovation and entrepreneurship. So, it's an important scheme. That's why please pay attention here. You can use it at any point of time. All right, it's managed by Niti Aayog. Now, what are the major initiatives under Atal Innovation Mission is Atal Tinkering Labs. All right, so it actually is uh, used at the school level programs to enhance the scientific temper of our school going children or create a problem solving mindset across schools in India. The Atal Incubation Centers is for fostering world class startups. All right, and adding a new dimension to the incubator model. In fact, it reminds me of my uh, year at XLRI, the second year at XLRI. We had an e-cell in our uh, college itself, which actually got funding from the government as well as from the Excel authorities to fund the entrepreneurs, the people who did not opt for placements and instead wanted to open up their businesses. So there was an incubator model that was there at XLRI. And a couple of people from Excel itself for example, Goonj and a couple of other initiatives, they have successfully built their own social entrepreneurship programs from that side. Okay, coming here. Good morning, Ram. Atal New India Challenges. So, we will be having product innovations in this. For example, the recent PPE kits development that we had or the COVID disinfectant, uh, uh, the machinery that we built or the one that kiosk we built to examine COVID patients. So the COVID warriors did not have to come in direct contact with the patient. So this is under Atal New Challenges program. Then there is the Mentor India campaign in which you establish a mentor network. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting. Most of the B schools actually have already a mentor campaign for them. So, uh, for example, in my uh, B school, the place where I come from, we have... Uh, an XLRI alumni network and they have their own mentorship programs in each city of India, wherever the uh, people are working from XLRI, for example, Chennai, Excel Mumbai chapter, Excel Jamshedpur chapter, Excel uh, Bangalore chapter, New Delhi chapter. So there you have people who are already in higher positions, know a lot about the business and they mentor the students who recently come out of the colleges. So we have it at a B school level. But now we have it at an India level supported by the government of India called Mentor India Campaign. And whenever, wherever you are, whether you are a startup or whether you are some uh, MSME or any other thing, you definitely require mentors 
to do better in a business or to actually land up in a successful entrepreneurship model. Then we have Atal Community Innovation Center. So there are certain innovations which are community centric. For example, they can benefit the entire public. So that is this model is specifically for tier two and tier three cities, some local initiatives that are taken care of. Then we have Arise or Atal Research and Innovation for Small Enterprises. Now, this program is actually very, very important. Why? This is important because social and sorry, small enterprises or MSMEs, they usually don't have enough money to do the innovation part. Now, they are the economic engines of the country. But imagine if we bring in some sort of innovation or if we are actually able to provide them with better machinery or better human capital, they can really contribute much more than what they are doing right now. So this program is specifically to simulate innovation and research in the MSME industry. Please keep in mind these four or five things. Uh, the better part to actually remember it is if you want, once the class is over, you can take a snapshot of this and keep it in your phone. So that whenever you want to revise Atal Innovation Mission, you can keep a photograph of this and you can easily remember all the six innovation things that are taken under place under the Atal Innovation Mission named after our former Prime Minister Ratul Bihari Vajpayee ji. Good morning, Aditya. Next question on your screens, folks. So another 20 seconds to read it. It's been in news recently, the Central Reserve Police Force and 30 seconds to answer it. And your time starts now. Okay, so Varun has already answered me. Varun and Kaveri and Amit have correctly answered it. Yes, it is actually both one and two. So this is actually a premier central force for internal security. They are not sent to the border areas. That's why Central Reserve Police Force, they were actually known as the Crown Reserve Police Force earlier and have been named Central Reserve Force by this act of 1949. So both these points are correct. Actually, they are celebrating 82 years of their history now or 82 years of their formation. That's why it was in news recently. And definitely internal security is a part of uh, GS paper 3. So we are supposed to cover this. Let's come here. So it was called Crown's representative force and uh, in 1939. And then actually it came in uh, the CRPF Act was actually came into force in 1949, 10 years later when we got independence. So definitely it's a premier central police force of Union of India for internal security. In fact, you can find CRPF forces mostly at the railway stations. You'll find some of them at the railway stations or at the bus stands also. And even at the airports. So mostly they are all at this important critical junctures to avoid any sort of criminal activity taking place at the transportation routes. So that's there. And uh, the act, the CRPF Act actually deals with the constitution of this force, the duties and control and administration of this force and the offenses and punishments that come under this force. And if anybody who does any discrepancy as a member of this force, what is to be done with them? So the entire act deals with the complete administration of the Central Reserve Police Force. All right. Okay, sorry, Gaurish, what happened? So you answered A, Y. They were established, but it is governed. That's what it is written here. So you can't have A. They are governed by the Central Reserve, Reserve Police Force Act. So the second is correct. Na? So how can you write A only? Yes, Aslam and Gaurish, understand this thing. The question is, the agency is governed. It's not talking about establishment. It's talking about governance. So it is governed under this act of 1949. That's why option one and two both are correct. Is it clear now? They are also part of the internal security forces now. Can you please, Danny, go and visit the defense chapter in India book? 
you will find all the various security forces that we have in India, be it the SAM rifles or the ITBP, they are all listed under the defense sector. So it's an important chapter for you to undergo if you want to read internal security. In fact, while I was preparing, what I did was I tore away the pages of defense from India Air Book and then I kept attaching notes to it of my own. So whatever fo police force was mentioned or whenever something happened under the defense sector, then I used to keep attaching notes to the uh, main notes that came under the defense sector in India Air Book. So you can do that also. All right. Okay. Let's proceed. So this is again in news, 30 seconds to read, 30 seconds to read, 20 seconds to read it and 30 seconds to answer. Time starts now. Okay, Nandu has already answered me. Uh huh. So, you guys recently read this? It was a news? Yes. Actually, the system has been very, very beneficial to us. Aslam, why have you marked it incorrectly? Because uh, understandably, C is the correct answer. A cannot be the answer. Any which ways. Because th 3 is incorrect. 3 is incorrect. So A is not the answer. B is not the answer. And D is not the answer. Why? Because we already know. It is an innovative technological solution. Aimed at strengthening immunization supply chain systems across the country. This is very intuitive. So option 1 is correct. Definitely. So the answer could be either option A or option C. But C is incorrect because it was not launched by Gavi India. It was actually done with the help of UNDP or United Nations Development Program. It's a project of UNDP in India. They helped India doing it. Yes, yes, Jitendra, it is one and two. So all those who have marked option number C are correct. And the program is actually being implemented under National Health Mission by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So let's actually look at it. So... This entire thing was in partnership with Gavi, which is a vaccine alliance to which we actually donated $1 billion recently for coronavirus vaccine, plus UNDP, plus Ministry of Health and Welfare. So it's launched by three and it was launched in 2015. So we actually built a supply chain intelligence network. That means it's a logistic framework. We will know what vaccines are available at which place what vaccines are not available, what vaccines are available to, uh, are, are going to expire so that we can order more vaccines. So it has actually enabled us to capture real-time data across the entire vaccine supply chain to aid our universal immunization program and our Indra Dhanush program. And currently, this uh, entire even network is actually helping us uh, aid our COVID vaccinization program. So we can actually, if we have a vaccine, or even if you want to do the trials, we can make use of this intelligence system or this ICT technology, which is taking part in the vaccine sector. Now, what are the benefits and why was it in news? So it was launched in 2015, but now seeing the benefits that are coming with the EVIN, we are trying to roll it out in all the remaining states. It's already there in 32 states and union territories. Now it will be launched in Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Chandigarh. Ladakh and Sikkim. So this was in the Indian Express and in the Hindu both. Alright. Agreed? Uh, understood? In fact, as a part of this program, so what's the conclusion, what's the outcome that vaccine availability has increased to 99% in almost health centers due to this kind of ICT infrastructure that we have. So it's a very, very good example of digital India. It is a good example of how we are using ICT 
in our most core sectors that is the health sector so you can use it as a very very good example something which has really worked yes UNDP right Sivranjini UNDP plus Gavi plus the Ministry of Health and Welfare, Family Welfare okay yes sorry Jatendra it's Jatin I remember okay chalo next question on your screen folks <coughs> Uh, is my voice audible? Am I properly audible to everybody? And is everybody able to understand? Are we moving? The pace is okay with everyone? Okay. So, I'll just start your timings in another 5 seconds. Great. This thing I think came yesterday itself. So this should be an easy one. Naveen, you're late to the class. Huh? Shouldn't be late to the class, folks. Come on time. Okay, everybody got it correct. Yes, actually we don't have this entire self-reliance thing. It's very intuitive also. Even if you didn't know the answer, Jatin and Nandu, Nandu has uh, planned to skip it, but the rest who have answered it, it is correct. A is the answer. So Jatin and Nandu, even if you didn't know it, just think about it very intuitively. Whenever we'll have a defense production and export promotion policy, definitely we will try to so the option number B becomes very intuitive because we will try to promote the export of defense products because that's what the policy is about. The second is we will try to encourage R&D, innovation, etc. because that has always been the agent of the government. So B and C both cannot be the answer. None of the above, let's see, none of the above automatically cannot be the answer because B, these two are objectives already. So none of the above cannot be the answer and hence by just simply logical animation, A becomes the answer. Now, otherwise, even if you don't know the facts, even if you can't do all this, just understand very simply, when it comes to the defense sector, it's a very, very sensitive thing. So first of all, we won't go around announcing that we will become independent in the defense sector by 2030. Second thing is, realistically speaking, it is very difficult, still very difficult, because defense development requires not only a lot of money, it also requires a very highly capable human resource force. So we still don't have this or a lot of equipments to actually test what we are kind of trying to develop. So we will definitely require international assistance at least for some time to come until the time we have complete accessibility to all the nuclear warheads or the nuclear machinery or even the missile technology. So we're still far behind than the other top five countries. So definitely we can't have complete self-reliance and defense manufacturing. We can have programs to move towards it, but definitely not put a date on it. So it's like that. Okay. Coming here, this was there in the PIB release. So yes, the answer is A. Now, what are the other goals and objectives of the scheme? So they are planning to have a turnover of 1.75 lakh crores. Yes, including export of 35,000 crores in aerospace especially. The second thing is they are trying to have better shipbuilding industry to cater to the needs of armed forces with quality products and to uh, enhance our Make in India initiatives, which is very, very intuitive and to create an environment of R&D, innovation and IP ownership. That means intellectual property ownership. This will actually become very, very important going forward so that the other countries or the other big organizations which are actually developing weapons or missiles or uh, working in the aerospace sector do not uh, file cases against India in the WTO. So we need to have proper IP ownership or proper intellectual property rights registration to move more towards the Atmanirbha Bharat Abhiyan. Additionally, I would want you guys to go and look at the package that has been announced for the defense sector. What is the FDI that has been permitted? What are the new rules that are coming in there? And then combine it and keep a complete answer. What you can do today also is combine the highlights from the PIB and combine the highlights from the Atmanirbhar Bharat package related to defense and then put it in your file so that whenever you want to revise, you have easy access to it. 
Now we'll start with the quick 10 section here folks. So there'll be some static questions and there'll be some questions from uh, the past year. Up till now we did it from August only. So there, uh, now there'll be questions from the past year. That, e that means from May 19 to August 2020. So let's see. All right. First question here. 10 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so I haven't received any answers yet. Now I have received. Okay, so Amit, why are you getting answers wrong? What happened? Office is taking a lot of time, not able to study properly. The correct answer is B, UAE. Amit, it will never be Iran. If it would have happened in Iran, we would have been hearing it left, right and center. Iran's nuclear program, they restarted it after the deal failed with the US, but then again restarting it and actually, you know, successfully completing it will actually take a lot of time. So intuitively also Iran cannot be the answer. Kuwait, we've never even heard about them. They're a small country, we haven't even heard about them. So the possible answers could have been either Saudi Arabia or UAE, all right? But UAE is actually far ahead of all these Arab nations. UAE is developmentally quite ahead. So definitely this becomes the quite intuitive choice and it has been in the news for a while. So all those who uh, gave option number B, they are correct. Option number A, I told you why it cannot be the answer. Iran was trying, it had a centrifuge, uh, uh, centrifuge uh, plant also, but they weren't actually finally successful because they pulled out due to the uh, Iran-US uh, deal. Yes, Prashant, it's Baraka. Very good, Nandu and uh, Prashant, you're correct. So this is where this place is, Baraka nuclear plant. This is UAE. This is Gulf of Oman. This is Strait of Hormuz. Remember, we have discussed this in the previous sessions. This is Persian Gulf here. Why is it Persian Gulf? Because this is Iran and Iran was called Persia in the past. Now, there you go. This is Abu Dhabi. Very closely located to Abu Dhabi is the Barak nuclear plant. Understood? And UAE now is the first country in the Arab world to actually produce nuclear energy. Now, why are we saying that it is the first one? So, this actually UAE was helped by Korea Electric Power Corporation of South Korea in actually uh, uh, achieving the criticality of this uh, nuclear reactor. And what do we mean by criticality of a nuclear plant? We mean that the fission reactions have started inside the nuclear power plant and the fission reactions can self-sustain themselves. The chain reaction has started and that electricity can now be produced. So that is what we are meant by, uh, what is meant by criticality of a nuclear power plant. Yes, it is for energy purpose only, uh, Amit. Yes, Aditya. So both of you, the thing is, uh, see how it happened. Originally, US and Iran had a deal that e US will remove the sanctions from Iran and Iran will completely shut down its nuclear facilities. Now, post the failure of the deal, <coughs> because the sanctions weren't being removed properly or Iran wasn't being given uh, access to peaceful uses of nuclear energy. So, Iran and uh, Iran wanted US to actually, you know, uh, do something about the deal. They wanted US to also act on its commitment of the deal. US decided after Trump came into power that they are not going to do anything about it. The deal break off. Now Iran is working in consortium with China, but definitely it's too early for it to actually resume its entire program because these are all very recent happening, something which has happened in the very, very recent past. And to nuclear for nuclear facilities to actually come up, they require a lot of time, especially for countries like Iran which is right now facing sanctions so much so that they actually scrapped the entire Chabar project also because India couldn't give them the money to continue with the Chabar project and that's why it went to China. So that's the whole idea. Is it clear Aditya Namit? 
we move on to the next question <coughs> i think my throat has again gone for a toss all right uh 15 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer so those who have joined my class late don't come late to the classes you lose out on good questions yes so please try to be on time everybody and your time starts now Okay, so Amit, your answer is option number B, is it? Okay. Okay, so guys, the correct answer is actually A only. Japan is not the only country who opposes a moratorium. It's Canada also and a couple of other countries which actually utilize whale meat. Usually now, whale meat is considered to be a delicacy in Japan. and i will tell you some interesting story about whale meat but as of now japan is not the only country canada is also there and some other nations are also there so the international whaling commission is actually there to curb the hunting of whales why because if you lose whales at a very high rate then you lose the entire ocean biological system or ocean ecosystem so for that we have the international whaling commissions which actually bans commercial whaling or commercial whale hunting and however they allow uh, uh whale hunting for aboriginal substance or for example there are certain communities which are very very old communities ancient communities which actually survive only on whale meat or which actually survive only on hunting whales and then uh, for their sustenance so there are non zero quotas means then in that cases whale hunting is allowed but not for any sort of commercial purposes whale hunting is allowed as per the iwc now let's look at this so this international whaling commission was actually set up in 1946 to provide for conservation of whale stocks in the ocean ecosystem and to lead to orderly development of the whaling industry and in 1982 iwc adopted a moratorium moratorium means complete ban on commercial whaling so japan canada and a number of other nations actually opposed this moratorium so it's not only japan however some these countries actually permit their citizens to have a to go for whale hunting especially for the aboriginal communities that means the very very ancient communities who have been inhabiting these nations for a while and they completely rely on whale hunting for their food and for their sustenance so coming here in 1994 the southern ocean whale sanctuary was also created by the international whaling corporation now why was it this entire thing in news this entire thing was in news because after a 31 years moratorium on commercial whaling japan decided to go against the international standards or the international ban on commercial whaling and set sail in july 19 to go ahead with commercial whaling though not on a very high scale the quota that japan has fixed for itself or the it has been fixed by the iwc is 277 whales so they'll be seeing what they want to do only two boats went around but they defied this ban to save face now the problem is interestingly yes it is legally binding because they actually set sail uh, it's an international ban and they so the signatories they actually acquiesced that yes we will not go for commercial whaling so this was signed in 1946 as i've already told and in 1982 uh, the iwc or the international whaling commission had a moratorium now imagine why do actually they have a legally binding treaty or something which actually binds them is because uh if you don't have it imagine if everybody goes and hunts whales in the ocean because a lot of countries have a huge huge coastline then there'll be a huge crisis so that's why this thing was put in place now coming here if we talk about it so interestingly the whale meat became popular in japan back in the times of world war 2 supposed world war 2 japan was completely ravished and ravaged so while they were actually forming back again whale meat was a cheaper source of nutrition 
so people started hunting whales and eating whale meat but now since it's prosperous again whale meal is now a delicacy people don't really consume a lot of whale meat now so even when japan wants to go ahead with commercial whaling they are still not very sure how the whale meat will be taken by the japanese if there is no local consumption there is no need to actually go for commercial whaling so that's the story behind it is it okay okay varun i don't know the number of members here i didn't go into looking for the entire history of iwc but you can please check it all right okay folks the next question is on your screens and 10 seconds to read it and 30 seconds to answer it it doesn't matter actually how many members are there because nobody is going to ask you the number of members what you really need to know is why it was in news and what is doing what about it all right okay next question on your screens because there are so many international organizations you cannot go ahead and remember the members and observer states in each one of them we'll only remember it for a very few prominent organizations okay so okay navin and nandu suman sivranjani all of you got it correct yes atul it is not both it is not both this option is incorrect it's actually a landlocked country no it has a coastline ivory coast do you remember ivory coast is very very famous this is related to this nation only coast the ivory that's why it cannot be a landlocked country so option 1 is automatically wrong that means option a and option c cannot be there now it was never colonized by any european country if you know that it's ivory coast and if you know that it was in africa then definitely it was colonized a couple of countries that weren't colonized were either nepal and bhutan okay so let's come back here so why was it in news that i'll tell you first so we actually india went ahead uh, our prime minister went ahead and we actually inaugurated a free trade zone for it and biotechnology in cote d'ivoire and that was an important milestone in the 150th anniversary celebrations of mahatma gandhi in 2019 so this entire free trade zone was built with the help of the exim bank and we gave 20 million dollars there so, so it actually is related to india africa relations right now this entire free trade zone has a computer assembly plant vsats networking labs human dna labs data storage network and all the other various ict uh, facilities and what is a free trade zone so it's a class of a special economic zone like what we have in india so usually it is used for warehousing storage purposes all right and it's a duty free area now coming back this is where cote the ivory is here yes aditya you are absolutely correct absolutely correct uh so this is cote de ivory the capital of cote de ivory is yamasokuru here it's in the central of the country and abidjan is a very famous port on the ivory coast it's here is it clear is it visible to everybody is the map visible to everybody and this is where cote de ivory is on in the african nation it's here in the western africa and ivory coast is on atlantic ocean so this part is not in central africa it's in western africa its capital is yamasokuru and abidjan is a famous port in cote d'ivoire or known as the ivory coast importantly who are its neighbor countries ghana burkina faso mali guinea and liberia are its neighbors yes understood everybody so yes it was colonized by the france and it is in western africa and it has a coastline it is not completely landlocked so the answer is d neither one nor two is correct let's move on to the next question okay so 10 seconds to read it and 30 seconds to answer it
ओके सो आई एम स्टार्टिंग द टाइम द यू गो फोक्स एनी डाउट सो फार एनी थिंग दैट यू वॉन्ट टू आस्क आर वी गुड टू गो आर यू वाइज एंजॉइंग द सेशन ओके सो कमिंग हियर आहा 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 गाइज ये वाला क्वेश्चन सही होना चाहिए था सबका एवरीबडी शुड हैव गॉट इट करेक्ट बिकॉज आई जस्ट डिस्कस्ड दिस एंड येट नो बडी ईरान इज अ मिडल ईस्टर्न कंट्री बट इट्स नॉट एग्जैक्टली एन अरब कंट्री ईरान इज नॉट एन अरब कंट्री इट्स एन एशियन कंट्री राधर यू कैन से नो बडी नो बडी हैज आंसर्ड इट करेक्टली वाई वाई इट फेल्स मी आई गेव यू अ वेरी वेरी बिगेस्ट हिंट हियर आई डिस्कस दी आर आईज प्रोग्राम and i said it was for the msmes do you remember yes thank you aslam so when we discuss that it is for the msmes how can you write that it is for the higher education institutions we just discussed it i think second or third question this obviously cannot be there because no international labor organization is involved there it's bill and melinda gates foundation yes but nobody has given me the answer d everybody is either a or b why were you guys not listening i'm highly disappointed because we just got this thing we just discussed it i was discussing arise and i said it's a very very important program because we really don't have a lot of innovation and research in the msmes amit you were there in the class when i discussed it so i'm highly disappointed with everybody i thought this would be a setter guys make mistakes do whatever wrong you want but listen properly listening is very very important i don't enjoy telling you everything i tell you everything we discuss each of the questions in detail why because even if the same question doesn't come in the exam you have all the information related to that particular question so that if any other question comes you can answer it so for this one one and a half hour the most important thing or the most important line to success is listening properly we are here just for 1 1.5 hours i don't even do a lot of questions because i don't want you to flood with information but whatever we do i want you guys to focus so the correct answer is d i already told you i crest we have discussed the arise program is for small enterprises so it is for the msme sector agreed so i told you guys yes you guys should be sorry highly disappointed so do this read this because it's an important mission see innovation ict are a big go go areas of our government and if you use them in your answers honestly trust me you will be getting fetching better marks than rest of the people see the whole idea of civil services is everybody writes the same answers but what you do extra it's like everybody will be serving a plain plate there roti sabzi dal if you add some pickle and some garlic chutney there your answer just becomes better and these kind of naming of the government schemes or initiatives if you are able to remember them that fat fetches you extra marks and not just for mains but also for prelims and obviously just going by the civil service values it is important that we know about such programs you are going to be a civil servant you are going to be responsible for a district right so take things seriously folks now <coughs> let's move on to the next question okay so there you go okay i think i've covered this already let's move on to question number 10 this is an interesting scheme all right so very very interesting scheme related to green revolution so i'm giving you a hint here related to green revolution very interesting scheme 15 seconds to read and 30 seconds to answer right 
The time starts now. Okay, so do I have a correct answer here? Okay, I have my first, Astam answered it correctly. No Atul, it's, you don't have to guess, I'll tell you. I gave you the hint, uh, Green Revolution. Do you guys remember? I said Green Revolution. When I talked about Green Revolution, Odisha cannot be the answer. It has to be Punjab, Haryana, UP, or those states which were, but primarily Punjab and Haryana, which were impacted by Green Revolution. Now, this Jalhi Jeevan Hai scheme is actually a very innovative one and very interesting one. I'll tell you why. So, in Haryana, they have paddy cultivation. And if you actually look at the climate map of India or the weather map of India, Haryana does not have much rainfall. So, what they do, they actually pump a lot of groundwater and then they have paddy or rice growing there. So, this scheme is actually to diversify from the paddy crop to other crops which require lesser water. And that's why Jalhi Jeevan has scheme. So this crop diversification scheme is there in Haryana. So very interesting scheme. Very good initiative by the Haryana government. Actually laudable initiative. So what we have been trying to do, up till now UP had, UPSC had been asking questions about a second green revolution or maybe a modified green revolution to control the adverse effects of the first green revolution. But this actually, this scheme is actually very practicable. That's the beauty of this entire scheme. Yes, green revolution may groundwater. So the groundwater comes from uh, by pumping the groundwater. So earlier, the groundwater table was very high in Punjab and Haryana. See, Punjab and Haryana, a lot of rivers actually flow through Punjab. So the groundwater was good enough. But it's these areas don't have a lot of rainfall, if you know. Okay, so in that case, if you keep pumping out water because rice is a very, very water intensive crop. So it's good for actually Odisha or West Bengal because they have frequency, a huge frequency of cyclones and a lot of water keeps flowing in all the round of the year. And that's why we have a lot of rice growing areas in Tamil Nadu and Kerala and the southern region because they have a lot of water because of the southeast monsoon. But these areas, Punjab and Haryana don't get that kind of monsoon. That's why we are having this kind of scheme here. Yes, Nandu, you're right. Now, coming here, Obviously, but how do you actually uh, force the farmers or coax the farmers to go for a crop diversification? You tell them that even if you grow something else, we will support you through the minimum support price and we will also support you giving you seeds and fertilizers. We will provide you support to grow other crops than rice. Second, restoration of groundwater table is one of the objectives of the scheme. So, it's a very, very wonderful initiative to actually... Uh, reverse the adverse impact of the first green revolution that we have in the 1960s. So the correct answer is option number C. Please go and study the scheme a little bit in more detail. In fact, I have it here for you it itself. So we are diversifying the paddy in the area into maize, arhar dal or pigeon pea and soybean. All right. Coming here, this is to actually reduce the area of water gazing crops in Haryana. Technological innovation to establish alternative crops for sustainable agriculture, resource conservation, restore groundwater table, control soil water fatigue because of rice wheat cycle that we have already discussed at one of the adverse effects of green revolution. Soil conservation and micronutrients balance should be conserved. And finally, how we are doing it that we will tell the farmer that we will there, we will be there to take your crop or to buy your crop if you are growing something other than paddy. Okay. Atul, which uh, scheme are you talking about? Because there are a lot of schemes going on. And Jaljeevan is for this one, Haryana. And this scheme, this one, the Jaljeevan scheme is actually for Haryana only. It's not for Odisha. So, Odisha is there as a wrong, uh, what do you say, option here. So, if you can completely put the sentence, maybe I'll get a hang of it. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. 
क्वेश्चन नंबर इलेवन अगेन एन इंटरेस्टिंग वन सो फिफ्टीन सेकेंड्स टू रीड इट एंड थर्टी सेकेंड्स टू आंसर पी एम एफ बी वाई एस प्रधानमंत्री फसल बीमा योजना आदित्य द क्रॉप इंश्योरेंस स्कीम A time starts now. This is again an interesting initiative in the field of agriculture. All right, very good initiative. So we'll study some of the couple of the objectives of this thing in a detail. Guys, there's a trap in this question, so read it carefully. All right, read it very carefully. And as I said, there is a trap, so no buddy has answered it correctly. Read your question carefully. What is it talking about? Nope, it's not A. It's not C. It's actually B. Option number three is incorrect. read the sentence again and you will understand why option number 3 is incorrect it's a question on beekeeping so a committee was set under bibek debroy who used to write articles in economic times on beekeeping so these are the recommendations from that committee did anybody get why option number 3 is incorrect yes amit it's importing honey we will never have simplifying procedures or specifying clear standards for importing we will never do that that will be for exporting honey because this entire committee was set up to actually increase the production and maybe able to export honey yes that's why option number 3 is incorrect yes that's what i changed here so option number 1 and 2 are correct and if you change this importing to exporting then option number 3 is also correct so this was a part of the bibek debroy committee he gave a couple of recommendations regarding bee keeping bee keeping in india so we are still eighth largest producer of honey in the world as per the food and agriculture organization and china is definitely performing better than us so we really want to get ahead in producing bee and exporting bee uh, exporting honey yes so let's come here so the economic advisory council to prime minister actually set up the bee keeping development committee under the chairmanship of professor bibek debroy he is a very very famous professor writes very well rounded articles in economic times so let's see what they talked about so the committee recommendations have recently come they said that we will recognize honey bees as inputs to agriculture that's a very important initiative now you start recognizing them as inputs to agriculture so might be beekeeping can get certain benefits from the government also considering landless beekeepers as farmers they will be given a farmer status so there are a, a lot of benefits associated with being a farmer now the second thing is we will be institutionalizing the national bee board that means it will become a proper institution so that it can engage in farmer welfare and beekeeping welfare and actually promote uh the pollinators and the beekeepers of india so it will be renamed as honey and pollinators board of india and it will come under ministry of agriculture and farmers welfare next they talked about that we will have some more research on apiculture bee uh, key beekeeping is also known as apiculture so we'll have some more research under the indian council of agricultural research training and development will be carried out by the state governments and there will be development and infrastructure related to storage processing and marketing of honey and we will simplify procedures and standards for exporting honey easily so that we can increase our uh, quantity of honey that we actually both produce and export so as of now we as per the 2017 18 data 
we actually export 51.5 thousand tons of honey severely increased but still we are lagging in the international markets yes understood everybody we'll move on to the next question this is related to the second outbreak of nipah virus in kerala so a couple of statements about nipah virus are here i'll give you 30 seconds to do it so i'll start the time directly because it's something we should have known up till now so it's a very very easy one if you can identify the trap here there is a trap here too okay yes nandu actually gave the correct answer it's one and three monkeys are not the natural host of nipa virus all these kind of viruses they usually have come from bats or camels bats camels and pigs so the camel flu of middle east the swine flu the recent corona flu is from bats or the h1n1 influenza is from birds but monkeys we have rarely seen them as natural host of any viruses yes so the correct answer is c navin why did you get this wrong aditya got it correct sanjeev why did you come late to my class kaveri and vidya why is it option number 1 what made you write only option number 1 because the symptoms of nipa are actually similar to what we saw for corona also apart from that it 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 has certain symptoms of zika virus also that means inflammation of the brain and fatal encephalitis but it is an acute respiratory infection and that's why kerala model was so much in news during the corona virus because they beautifully controlled the nipa virus outbreak so this was in news because in july last year also we had a second outbreak of nipa virus after 2018 breakout of nipa virus So Nipah virus first thing is a zoonotic virus that means it can be transmitted from animals to humans monkeys no bats are a natural host of nipah virus and third is correct even here we don't see the symptoms however it is an acute respiratory infection and it can lead to encephalitis yes aditi you right fruit bats in alu very good so suman sevranjini you got it correct Sanjeev you also get it got it correct but why are you late Sumit you got it correct Asam got it correct Gayatri you new to my class you got it correct Navin why did you get it incorrect where was the acha you were not sure of option number 3 okay fine if you were not sure of option number 3 okay so 2 is incorrect 3 you're not sure that's why option number 8 all right chal let's come to question number 13 folks So, fifteen seconds to read it. It's an easy one, and then thirty seconds to answer it. Guys, is the class getting a little heavy? Is it getting a little heavy? Are you guys okay? Is it helpful? All right, Sanjeev. time starts now great because i want this one one and a half hour that we spend to be very useful to you people that's the whole idea of the class great so much okay so let's proceed yes nandu is correct so whoever has answered option number c they are correct i think this time you got the trap yes it is not an initiative of the union government it is an state initiative of the state government so it's like their own national registry of citizens it's a localized national registry of citizens for the naga residents 
So the Naga residents have a problem with the Manipuris and the illegal Bangladeshi immigrants coming in. So Nagaland people say that they are not one of us and yet they corner all the jobs and the lands. So they marry local Nagaland women and then they take hold of the land. This also actually happens in Meghalaya. Yes? So Bidya, why did you get it wrong? Why D and why not C? Because 2 is like very, very intuitive. Because the inhabitants of certain northeastern states have more rights in their states than the people who come from outside. That The special provisions. Do you guys remember? We discussed the special provisions. That's part 21 of the constitution. Remember? Article 371 and then 371A is for Nagaland till G that we have already discussed in our previous sessions. Yes. So, RIIN or Register of Indigenous Inhabitants of Nagaland. Yes, it's the official first master list of Nagaland's indigenous inhabitants. The objective is to prevent people from acquiring fake residency certificates or indigenous inhabitant certificates so that they do not occupy the lands or the government jobs or any other facilities that the government provides to Nagaland under the special provisions. Going forward, this was there in the Hindu in July 19. Now they have completed the registry already. Let's move on to question number 14. Vidya, you haven't answered me. What happened? Easy one. So I'm starting your time right now. Okay, so any correct answers so far? Very good, Naveen. Okay, yes, option number B is correct because it's not Ministry of Defense, it's Ministry of External Affairs. Do you guys know there is an additional important information? Uh, Bangladesh is the only country for which we have a separate division dedicated. That's the kind of importance we accord to Bangladesh in our foreign policy. So it's the only country which has a separate division, completely separate division dedicated to handle Bangladeshi affairs. And the recent Indo-Pacific division has been set up for Indian Ocean Rim Association. I've already discussed this in my IR classes on YouTube that are there. ASEAN region, Association of Southeast Asian Nations and the Quad. Can anybody tell me who are the members of Quad? Australia, US, Japan, India? Yes. Now it's Quad plus one. Vietnam and South Korea and New Zealand have also joined in. Piyush, why option number A? Yes, Nandu, MEA. Madhu, it's not option number A, it's option number B. Gayatri, it's option number C, nahi hai. Achha, I, <laughs> Aditya is option number B, pakka. very good Aditya. Vidya, why are you getting answers wrong? Okay, so the Quad has America, uh, Australia, United States, Japan and India. Quad plus is Australia, United States, Japan, India plus Vietnam, South Korea and New Zealand. Remember it? Because the Quad and the Quad Plus were both in news when the recent Galwan Valley standoff happened between India and China. Yes? Yes, Astam. Yes, Aditya. Next question on your screen, folks. Let's move on. Okay, Piyush, you retract messages and then you go back to that. It's okay. Next question on your screen, folks. 20 seconds to read it and 30 seconds to answer it.
Your time starts now. Sanjeev, why option number C? Nandu has said option number B. Okay. Suman has also said B. Okay, folks. Uh, the correct answer is option number B actually. Uh, one and three. This part, no. Not all relief activities are actually carried by Ministry of Home Affairs for agriculture distress or agriculture calamities. It is actually taken care of by Ministry of Agriculture and hence option number B is incorrect. It is incorrect. That's why the correct answer is option number B. One and three both are correct. NDRF is a part of the public accounts of government which is already given in the constitution. Yes. The second is the NDRF amount can be spent only towards meeting expenses for emergency response, relief and rehabilitation. This amount is already for that. The NDRF funds have been in news because these funds have now been given to the state governments. It was mentioned in the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan package that was announced by Nirmala Sitaraman. She said, seeing the contingency that was there, we released the NDRF funds in advance to the state governments so that they can meet the COVID crisis nicely. Yes, Piyush, you are right. Yes, Varun, both of you are right. Amit, you got it incorrect. Aslam, you got it incorrect. Sivranjani, incorrect. Varun, Prashant, right. Sumit, incorrect. Aditya, very good. You got it correct. Gayatri got it correct. Okay. So, let's talk about it here. So, this is what we have. As of now, the NDRF or the National Disaster Response Fund is financed through CES on certain items and excise and customs duty on certain other items and it is a part of the finance bill. Also, the additional budget is provided through the national calamity contingency duty and other budgetary support is given to the NDRF. Additionally, this NDRF is located in the public accounts of government of India under reserve funds not bearing interest. That means these funds do not give any interest to the government of India. The last point which actually made the difference is Department of Agriculture and Cooperation is actually responsible for monitoring relief activities for calamities associated with drought, hailstorms, pest attacks and cold wave or frost while other any other natural calamities are monitored by the Ministry of Home Affairs. Sorry. No, not exactly actually. Nandu has answered your question, Aslam. Guys, I think it's raining here. So as of now, the network is working fine, but there might be a slight disruption because, because it's raining very heavily in Jaipur right now, extremely heavily. Yes, Sanjeev, the correct answer is option number B. Got it? So we'll move on to the next question. Now it's the rapid fire round, folks. So I hope there is no internet disruption at my end because it's raining extremely, extremely heavily. So you all know the rules of this rapid fire five round. We'll have five questions. So we'll be selecting the top three and the fastest three. Yes. So those who answered correctly in the least amount of time. And then I'll declare the final winners. Agreed? So we'll proceed. There you go. First question on your screens, only 30 seconds to answer. That's the another rule. 30 seconds to answer, top three and fast three. Your time starts now. Amit, it's not even drizzling. It's it's like a total, uh, it's, it's all blurry outside. It's raining very heavily here. <coughs> so I'll complete this as soon as I can so there is no disruption in our class. And Aditya, these questions have been put here because of your special request to have some static questions on history and geography, right? Okay. So, Nandu, okay. Actually, Aslam got it correct first. 
Aslam uh, got it correct. It's actually both. It's now option number C. So Aslam, Shivranjani, and Sumit are my top three here. Aslam. Aslam, Shivaranjani and Sumit are my top three here. Yes, the correct answer is option number three or option number C. Both one and two are actually correct. Gola Dhodo is also an ancient Indus Valley civilization located in Gujarat. And Ahmedabad, we all know, is actually located on the bank of Sabarmati River. In fact, if you have the, I went to Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad. And I visited the Sabarmati waterfront. So yes, Ahmedabad is located on Sabarmati River. And it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Not just that, it's a World Heritage City also. So both Jaipur and Ahmedabad are World Heritage Cities. Ahmedabad was the first one to get the World Heritage City status. Okay. Uh, this is the map where the entire sites of the Harappan phase are there. Now I'll show you where the sites that I've just mentioned here are. Exactly. So this is the Gola Dharo site here. This one. At the border of Gujarat and Maharashtra. This is Lothal here. At the site of Sabarmati River. Sabarmati River is here. The one, the yellow line that I'm showing. Or let me use a different color of pen to actually show you this. The blue line is the Sabarmati river here. This is the Mahi river here. So, and then I'll use the yellow pointer to point out the cities that we have just discussed. So, Rojadi is here, another very important site. Rangapur is in Gujarat. Dhola Veera is this blue bigger dot here. Then you have the Gola Dhodo. I think Gola Dhodo, very few people know about it. Then you have Lothal here on Sabarmati. So these are few important sites, Harappan sites. Gola Dhodo is actually very difficult to find in a map. That's why this was one map where I could find it. And it's the most clearly visible map, though with a lot of sites here. Uh, is it okay? Are you people able to follow this? Not very clearly visible. So I can maybe share the image with you guys so that you can see it for yourself. So this exactly why I took this because this was the Ministry of Tourism's Dekho Apna Desh webinar series where they actually told about heritage tourism in Gujarat. So that's where they were talking about it. So I thought that I'll include it here in my class. Now, additionally, there is a Rani Ki Vav, which is 11th century step well in Gujarat, which is also very famous. And the Gujarat architecture is actually made out of the Solanki dynasty. It's a very famous dynasty of Gujarat which actually led to a lot of heritage development in Gujarat in the 11th and 12th centuries. And Sultan Ahmed Shah actually set up the Ahmedabad, the present capital of, sorry, not capital, but an uh, important city of Gujarat. Are we good to go, folks? We already know about Bharuj and Khambat, the Gulf of Khambat or the Gulf of Kambe and Bharuj. They were important to Maurya and Gupta empires. Yes? So I'll proceed. Okay. Uh, seen in currency. Yes, seen in current. Yes, Aslam. And Lothal is believed to be one of world's first seaports. So that's an important information. Okay, we'll move on to the next question here. I think then, okay. So question number 17, easy one. It was recently in news. So 30 seconds to go. Nagaraj, you're new to my class. So the rules of the game here are 30 seconds I'll give you to answer the question. And top three who answer it correctly in 30 seconds. So after five questions, whoever wins the competition of the rapid fire, we'll announce his name. That will be the winner of the rapid fire round. Okay, let me see some answers here. Okay, so I haven't received a correct answer yet. Okay, my, I've received my first correct answer. 
That's for Nandu actually. Option number B is only correct. You know what? This Vidyarthi Vigyan Manthan is actually for school going students to raise a scientific temper in them. So it is actually not for funding high risk or high reward science research. No. Option number one is incorrect. The correct answer is in fact, uh, the second one that it's an initiative of Vigyan Bharti in collaboration with Vigyan Prasar and National or NCRT. So three of them have combined to actually give us this Vidyarthi Vigyan Manthan. It was in news on AIR yesterday itself that uh, the government is taking such initiative apart from the smart hackathon. Have you heard about the smart hackathon that recently concluded? A lot of students will be participating to address 200 or more problems that are being faced by the nations. So this was also, this Vidyarthi Vigyan Manthan was also announced simultaneously with this program. So the correct answer is option number B. Now who has answered me correctly? I will take their names. So it was Nandu first. And Madhu. And I did not get a third person who answered it correctly. Okay. So let's move on. This uh, initiative has been launched by Health and Family Welfare Minister Vidyarthi Vigyan Manthan 2021. And we will be popularizing science among school going students from class 6 to 11. So it's related to them. A very, very uh, fledgling initiative for the school going students. Question number 18 on your screen, folks. And your time starts now. <laughs> the rain has subsided. So maybe the class can go on properly. It's an interesting question. It's related to art and architecture. So I'll discuss it a little bit more in detail. Maybe it will be informative for you. Okay, so any answers so far? Okay, so I have only got two correct answers as of now. No, I've got my three correct answers. So I'll announce. Option number A is actually correct. The Udaygiri caves, they are actually present at three places in India. Udaygiri is in Madhya Pradesh, Vidisha. Udaygiri in Odisha, the Bhubaneswar caves. Udaygiri in Khandagiri. And Udaygiri in Bihar. That's why I've specifically mentioned the Madhya Pradesh ones. They were not constructed during the reign of Ashoka, but in fact, they are one of the only caves which can be corroborated to the Gupta period. And they are the sites of three, Vaishnav, Shakti and Shaiva or Shaivism. The Udaygiri caves completely represent all the three forces of Hinduism, Vaishnavism, Shaivism and Shakti. So these are the Udaygiri caves for you, but they are related to Gupta period and not the reign of Ashoka. The Kailash temple, yes, is located at Elora. In fact, it is one of the largest single monolithic pieces of rock cut architecture. That's why it's so famous. So that's the Kailash temple for you. Elora caves are known for their Hinduism, Jainism and Buddhist architecture. Whereas the Ajanta, Kelo, Ajanta caves are only known for their Buddhist architecture. This is cave number, I think, 16 in Kailash. Buddhist viharas, we all know, viharas were meant as a place for shelter or for dwelling in rest of the Buddhist monks. So option number A is correct. So my top three here are Sumit for question number 18, Naveen and Aslam. Okay. Why are they not visible, Sumat? What happened? Why are they not visible? Any problems? Let me know. Folks, this is the Udaygiri caves. They were constructed during the times of Gupta. That means the 5th century. 5th to 6th century. Now, this, these are the very famous Udaygiri caves. If anybody is from Madhya Pradesh 
and if you have the opportunity please go and visit them beautifully constructed and you can see all three kinds of uh, uh, shaivites vaishnavites and shakti deities here so please go and visit it and if you do get a chance to visit it please let me know how was the experience because due to the corona lockdown i really can't go out otherwise i would have loved to go on another india tour that i've already undertaken once while i was working with ey would want to do it again so these are the udaygiri caves for you this is the kailash temple it was built in the between 7th to 8th century by the rashtrakuta rulers krishna 1 rashtrakuta dynasty was a dynasty in the deccan region and it was built by krishna 1 it was the climax it is considered to be the climax of rock cut architecture in india and you can see it's a beautifully built temple the shikhara is taken from the dravidian form of architecture are you good to go guys it's a shiva temple kailash temple it's a shiva temple there is a stone statue of nandi outside the temple that you can see it's on a porch just like it is there in the kedarnath temple so beautifully constructed three or four story temple uh is it the problem with everybody else because uh, i'll tell you something suman as i'm teaching you guys i'm simultaneously watching the youtube session with you guys on my cell phone so that i can watch so that i can actually see the entire chat and i can see the questions quite uh, uh, properly i don't see any problem there suman okay so next question on your screen folks question number 19 the second last question for today and your time starts now it's an interesting one aditya liking the questions found them interesting actually i found them to be pretty interesting they open up new vistas in the way you actually understand ancient history or you understand art and culture of india okay aha uh -huh. okay so i have got my first correct answer I have only got two people answering it correctly as of now. Okay, I've got my top three, so I'll announce. Yes, the correct answer is one, two, and four. It was not opposed to the Vedantic views of Hinduism. It actually supported Vedantic view of Hinduism. It supported, not opposed. So that's why option number three is incorrect. The rest three are correct. It was a splinter group of the Brahmo Samaj formed in eighteen thirty nine. Brahmo Samaj was in 1828. Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar, yes, he was the secretary of the Sabha, and it was found by Devendra Nath Tagore. Now, there are some very interesting facts about Tatva Bodhiri Sabha. So I'll tell you what they are. But first, I'll announce the top three from for this question. So the top three are Nandu, Sumit, and Aditya. Okay, great, Aditya. Now coming here. so what was happening after uh, raja ram mohan's death he found the brahmo samaj and they believed in monotheistic god that there is just one god and they believed in adi dharma so still adi dharma is followed in some areas of india they actually do not believe in all the brahmanical rituals and they feel there is one god and everybody can reach that god so after ram mohan roy's death there were certain other brahmanical elements in brahmo samaj who actually got back idolatry or who actually got back into the old habits of the brahmanical rituals that's why devendranath tagore decided to separate it and they launched the tatva bodhini sabha so that they can restore raja ram mohan roy's legacy and they found it in 1839 now because they actually found it interestingly you will see if you actually go and research about rabindranath tagore so rabindranath tagore and his brothers were unable to find brides for themselves because those who followed adi dharma the other brahman households they did not give girls to rabindranath tagore or his brothers to marry so that was a very difficult time for the tagore people devendranath tagore is the father of uh, rabindranath tagore's father so 
sorry, Devinath Tagore is the father of Rabindranath Tagore, and he is the son of Dwarka Nath Tagore. He's a very, he was a very very famous trader, very very famous in the um, Bengal circles. So they actually separated, and they tried to carry on for a while. However, later, somewhere in 1859. uh devinath tagore again dissolved the tatvabodhini sabha and they combined again with brahmo samaj now brahmo samaj has been reduced to a minority but still some people follow the um, what do you say the teachings of brahmo samaj and they follow the adi dharma okay so there you go and now we come are we clear because i'll go on to the last question for today and your time starts now so if there are any doubts so far please let me know and your time starts now <coughs> it's a very easy one so most of you should get it correct okay so i already got my top 3 here folks yes the correct option is option number c so aslam sumit and amit answered it correctly shivranjini also answered it correctly but she was a little late so the quit india movement was not a corollary as a failure of the cabinet mission no it was the crips mission which came in march 1942 and then we finally launched the quit india movement was launched by gandhi in 1942 Yes the first half of the movement was peaceful the second half was a little violent and yes there were parallel governments established in some parts of india that was a significant feature of the quit india movement so let's see what happened and how it happened so crips mission i have already discussed in detail in our previous session what were the proposals of the crips mission that we will have a dominion of india however they were not yet very sure about giving complete independence to india and that's why the entire crips mission failed similarly the cabinet mission failed that came after the crips mission in 1946 now here in august 8 1942 mahatma gandhi gave the do or die call at the gobalia tank maidan in bombay so even though the speech which mahatma gandhi gave it actually was not very well taken care by jawaharlal nehru or maulana azad because they were apprehensive of some violence taking place but they still believed in gandhi's leadership and this was actually against that uh, right now world was actually going through a lot of crisis because it was world war 2 was going on and british really wanted india's support that's why they had sent in the crips mission but it failed to satisfy either parties either the muslim league or the uh, indian national congress however the muslim league still wanted to support the british in their uh, world war 2 initiatives because under the crips mission they could actually go and form a separate uh, state of pakistan so that was how it was yes sumit it was an easy one so coming here where where were their parallel governments established so one was in balia east up all right under the leadership of chittu pande it's there all these things are there in the book ac chatterjee india's freedom for uh, india's freedom struggle yes the second one was in midnapur district in bengal the jatiya sarkar and in maharashtra satara also emerged the seat of a parallel government which lasted till 1944 so these are the three places where we had parallel governments as a significant feature of the quit india movement all right the second part definitely got very violent with raids and uh, uh, setting up a fire at post offices government buildings and railway stations something which wasn't envisaged by gandhi completely but not completely written off by him also now he was actually fed up with the british government by the dilly dallying so this time it was a do or die call so folks uh with that i have the winners of this session actually so i'll just announce the winners so for question number 20 we have aslam sumit and amit i think yes 
So, our winners for this session are actually, so question number 16, the top three were Aslam, Shivranjani and Sumit. Question number 17, I only had two people, Nandu and Madhu answering correctly. Question number 18, Sumit, Naveen and Aslam. Question number 19, Nandu, Sumit and Aditya. Question number 20, Aslam, Sumit and Amit. So definitely we have a clear winner here. It's Sumit. So Sumit, very good performance. Yes. I'm very happy for you that you actually got it all correct. And you were featured in the top five almost four times. The highest as of now. Everybody has featured either two or three times. So this is the first time somebody has been in the top three in four out of five questions. So your preparation is going on at a good scale. At least the static part is very nicely prepared. So kudos to you, Sumit. Very well done. Congratulations for today. All those who are new to this session, this is my Telegram group link for current affairs and this is my Telegram channel link. At both these places, I post all my upcoming videos either on YouTube or on Unacademy so that you can be there for the classes and you don't miss the classes. The next class on YouTube is on 11 a.m. on 7th of August. And tonight I have a similar class, this class, but different questions on an academy platform at 8.30 p.m. I'm also launching my IR course so that we can completely prepare all the IR sessions that is on the Unacademy and that will be launched from 10th of August, 8.30 p.m. in the evening. Also, for subscription under any of the courses on UPSC, Yes, Aditya, I mentioned that. So on UPSC, uh, for any courses under the UPSC CSE category, you can use my code SBUS to get an instant 10% off. And if you liked the session, please hit the like button. Also, please subscribe to our channel so that you can watch more videos from me and from all the other wonderful educators that we have on the platform. And use my code SBUS for any subscriptions under UPSC CSE category. You'll get an instant 10% off of your fee. So you're welcome, folks, and congratulations, Sumit. And with that, I'll close for today. Hope you guys enjoyed the session. Great, folks. Chalo, we'll close for today. Thank you and have a good day. And see you in the evening at 8.30 p.m.